Albert Einstein. We all love Albert Einstein. And when I say all, I mean pretty much everyone. The US, the Soviets, the Germans, the Indians, Congolese, Cubans, Tajiks, you name it, we all love Einstein. Stop at a traffic light. Read the bumper stickers in front of you. As often as not, whose quotations are you looking at? Einstein. Imagination is more important than knowledge. I know not what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. And my favorite, only two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity, and I'm not sure about the former. So what is it we love about Einstein? Smart guy, sarcastic remarks? Well, that's part of it. Why do you love Einstein? I'm sure some of you are thinking, the hair, right? And that's certainly a part of it, right? Einstein is special. Einstein, is, Einstein represents something. Einstein is iconic. He represents something that is contemporary, something that's special. What is it? I want to claim it's cosmopolitanism. Now, what do we mean by this term? Well, it comes from the Greek words cosmos, which refers to the universe, and polis, which refers to the city. What it originally meant was that we are all citizens of the world, right? And one sense of it is this idea that we are simply all one big human family. There's no real differences between us, right? We should all come together into one big universal group hug. That's not the sense of cosmopolitan that I'm using. I want to use it in contrast to these notions, provincialism, parochialism, the idea that knowledge, insight, wisdom comes to just us in our little cube, right? Us in this little place, we are the chosen people and we and we only have access to this wisdom. Cosmopolitanism, on the other hand, is the idea that wisdom, knowledge, insight comes from everywhere. And that what we really need to do is to listen to everyone, especially those who are different. That, I think, is what we see in Einstein. Einstein's hair, that iconic hair, what does it really represent? I'm thinking differently. I'm not fitting into the social norms, right? I'm who I am. Now, not everyone was enchanted by this cosmopolitan ethic of Einstein's. On the, on the left here is Philip Lennard. He won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1905. Johannes Stark won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1919. They were two of the leaders of the Aryan Physics Movement. Between the World Wars, there was a group of nationalist Germans who argued that science, like everything else, is conditioned by race, conditioned by blood. And that there was legitimate science, Aryan science, and then there was Jewish science. And Jewish science and Jewish art and Jewish music was polluting the culture. They thought they were in a great struggle. They thought their culture was under attack. They held the provincial view. They had unique access to truth. Einstein threatened that. And so they called the theory of relativity Jewish science in an attempt to denigrate it. Well, this leaves us two questions. Are they right? Was Einstein's theory of relativity really Jewish science? And the second is, well, were the Nazis right to be afraid of it? That first question is a tricky one in part because it requires understanding what this phrase Jewish science means. It's not very clear. Does it mean science by a Jew? Was Einstein a Jew? Well, he thought so. The Nazis thought so. Ask any Jew today, they think so. Of course, they all mean different things by the term Jew. Is it science that comes from Judaism? Science that comes from Torah or Talmud? Well, turns out, no. We know who Einstein was reading. We know he was looking at the work of physicists like the Dutchman, H.A. Lawrence, the Frenchman Henri Poincaré, the German uh, Ernst Mach, none of them were Jewish. 
So in that sense, no, it wasn't. But were the Nazis right to be worried about it? Yeah, they were. All right, because for them, this notion of Jew wasn't just non-German. It was anti-German, right? Jews are a strange people in that if you think about how the world was before the founding of the modern state of Israel, Jews represent a challenge to the very categories by which we made sense of the world, right? If you wanted to know who someone was, you asked, where are you from? What language do you speak? What king are you, do you pledge your allegiance to? What church do you go to? Jews were strange, right? They were everywhere, but always in the minority. If you wanted to defeat the British, you invade Britain. You overthrow the king. If you wanted to control the Catholics, what do you do? You take over the papacy. If you wanted to control the Jews, where would you invade? Who's their leader? Who do they listen to? Who do they obey? It made no sense. Jews undermined the very categories by which we made sense of the world. And for that, they were particularly dangerous because they were outsiders. The German word that Einstein would use was Einspanner, right? He is outside of the culture. Now, being an outsider puts you in a weird position. See, if you're in the majority, if you have the power, what you get to do is define the concepts. You get to make the language, make the categories through which we see the world, and you force everyone to see it your way. So if you're in the minority, if you're the outsider, you have to see it their way. But of course, you don't only see it their way. You also see it your way, right? Outsiders have an advantage. They see things more than one way. So they can see answers. They can see approaches that other people don't see. But if you are convinced of the provincial truth, that we alone have the right way, then those outsiders are perverting the truth. And so they're really dangerous. Why? Not only do they have this advantage, it's an advantage that'll confuse you, it'll baffle you, and then they can take everything you've got. Think of the stereotype of Jews, right? In the marketplace, they'll baffle you, they'll confuse you, they'll bargain you down, and in the end, you'll think you got a deal, and then you'll get home and you'll realize, oh, right? And it's all because they have more than one point of view. Now, was Einstein's theory Jewish in this way? Well, in a sense it was. Einstein gives us the physics of an outsider. Now, if you want to understand the theory of relativity, there are two basic ideas, invariance and covariance. Okay. Suppose I were to ask you, is this clicker to the left or right of the hand? You would say, to the left. And I would say, you're kidding me, it's to the right, right? That's covariant, right? There is a fact as to whether it's to the left or the right, but it depends where you sit. For you, it's to the right. I'm sorry, to the left. For me, it's to the right. Now, if someone out there said, oh, it's to the left, they would be wrong, right? So there is a fact of the matter, but the fact of the matter depends on where you sit. Now, suppose I ask, is it between the hands? Now, it doesn't matter where you sit. That's a fact. That's an invariant truth. And what Einstein did was to show that certain things that we thought were true, duration, length, mass, energy, things we thought were simply unique, objective facts of the world were actually covariant. They varied with your reference frame, with your viewpoint, right? So how long is this? Well, it's about three inches. So no matter where you are, no matter how you look at it, it's three inches, right? What Einstein said is, when I'm walking straight at you, and you measure it, if I'm going very fast, you're going to measure two inches. I, because I'm at rest with respect to it, will still measure three inches. So which one of us is right? Is it two or is it three? Well, just like to the left of or the right of, it's a function of perspective. What was the time difference between those snaps? That was a second. Well, if you're moving, Einstein argues, that time is going to stretch, right? So for me, 
who's at rest with respect to my hand, it will always be a second. But for you, it may be a second and a half. Well, which one of us is right? Well, there's right in a viewpoint. It's covariant. Now, not everything in the theory of relativity is relative. Turns out there are invariant quantities. So if we take distance and we take time, each of them is covariant. But we can add them together in a particular way to get what we call the space-time interval. And that's going to be the same for everyone. It's a four-dimensional measure. Now, we all live in a three-dimensional world with a one-dimensional time. So we can't experience directly this four dimensions, but we can compute it. And we all compute the same number. So even though each of our individual experiences will differ, there are going to be ways of putting them together that get you to a universal truth. And in this way, we do see a Jewish science, a cosmopolitan science. Now, Einstein points this out not only in his science, but in his other writings on ethics, politics, peace, education. Einstein wrote on issues across the spectrum, and always it was from the perspective of an outsider, never making the claim that he had unique access to absolute truth, but always as somebody adding another voice. And with that extra voice, we get some sense of insight that we might not have otherwise had. Now, the outsider has it tough. You have these insights, but you're generally not allowed to share them because they are not the insights of those with the power. And so we end up with a conflict, a problem, something that in Einstein's time was called the Jewish problem. And this was discussed by non-Jews and Jews alike. The question is, look, this is their place. They have the power. They have the control. We're just here. What do we do? How can a minority live in someone else's home when this is our home? And there were two approaches. The assimilationists said, well, we'll just become them. They won't bother us if we're like them. So we'll give up what's special about us. We'll give up what's our own personal deep identity, and we'll assume their identity. Well, clearly there were concerns by those who thought, well, there's something meaningful about who we are. And so on the other hand, we had the segregationists who said, look, they are how they are. They have the control, so what we will do is we will establish our little zone. And in this walled-off little city, we can just be us. So they'll leave us alone if we just stay in here. And so there were long conversations between these two groups. Should we give up who we are to fit in? Or should we stay who we are and separate ourselves off? Now, this conversation was one that Einstein just detested. And he came up with a third way. Both of these views make an assumption, an important assumption that he sought to undermine. Both of these assert that they, the majority, control the culture. It never occurred to them that maybe we could change that. Maybe we could share. And what Einstein did was bring a revolution in physics. Physics, which captures our imagination, right? Immanuel Kant uses the term a Copernican revolution to describe his change in philosophy because changes in physics change how we see the universe, how we see the world, how we see everything. Einstein changed physics. And with the change in physics came changes in everything else. He's writing at the same time that we see changes in art, changes in music, radical changes in politics and economics. What Einstein represents by changing the way in which we see space and time itself is the way we see everything. What Einstein represents is this notion of intellectual cosmopolitanism, that each of us has a perspective that has some access to insight. All of us 
Einstein could be any of us. Einstein could be a woman. Einstein could be a Hindu, an Arab, a Jew. Einstein is all of us. And we all love Einstein. Why? Because Einstein lets us be us. Thank you.